programming on WTTW is made possible in part by viewers like you and by the following. In 1945, Walter Smith Sr. opened a family business in his name. Four generations in, and the Smith family remains committed to the ideals he set forth. Offer furniture for all Chicagoans, including a variety of styles and price points, and provide service to all who enter our doors, including in-store and in-home design assistants. We look forward to welcoming you into the Smith family, just as we have since 1945. It started with a crown, then a bridge, then dentures. But you kept losing teeth and keeping pain. Dental implants are a permanent, custom-made answer to decay and loss, the closest thing to having your real teeth. Eon Clinics keeps the entire process under one roof with a team that works together to make you feel at home so you can have more to give to the people you love. Come together with Chicago Shakespeare Theater starting October 6th. Hear the Beatles' hit songs mixed with Shakespeare's poetry. See Oscar nominee Davis Strathairn. Enjoy a hip-hop holiday hit or a Broadway-bound new musical and much more. Tickets now at chicagoshakes.com. WTTW programming originates from the Renee Crown Public Media Center. Everybody say babies! Babies! In Nurse's house, midwife speaking. I can't imagine a future without you in it. It is good news, is it not? Sunday at 7 on WTTW. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz on the show tonight. We're looking at just the excitement that it brings to not only Arlington Heights, but the regional approach that we have here with the other communities. The Chicago Bears could soon have a new home. We have local reaction in a live report from that northwest suburb. Urge him to offer remote learning for all families. Chicago Public Schools' new CEO considers changes to the remote learning policy. WBEZ and the Chicago Sun-Times intend to merge. We hear from Chicago Public Media's CEO on the surprise deal. It feels good, but we have a lot of work to do. Inside the plan to bring housing, retail, and green space to a huge vacant property on the far south side. Meet one of the new MacArthur Genius Grant recipients and hear about her commitment to social justice. How bird droppings might unlock the secrets to climate change. We'll explain. They're coming. Fields is in trouble. Racing away and he's sacked again. Oh, a tough first NFL start for rookie quarterback Justin Fields. We preview the Bears matchup with the Lions. In Heist tonight as part of our Chicago Tonight in Your Neighborhood series. Now located 25 miles northwest of downtown, I'm at Arlington International Race Course, which includes about 326 acres of land and could be the future home of the Chicago Bears. Now Arlington Heights is a family-oriented suburb that is seeing a growth in population. We hear from local businesses on the economic recovery from the pandemic and, of course, about the Bears' possible move here. But first, we toss it back to you. Arlington Heights in the spotlight this week. Thanks, Joanna. And now to some of today's top stories. Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle says she's running for another term. Preckwinkle made the announcement today on social media. She touts her response to the COVID-19 pandemic as well as helping businesses and residents weather the economic fallout as reasons that she believes voters should give her a fourth term. Preckwinkle ran for Chicago mayor in 2019 and lost in a runoff to Lori Lightfoot. The city is awash in tax increment financing money. A new report from Cook County Clerk Karen Yarbrough says the city took in a record $1 billion plus in TIF money in 2020. That's up about 13.5% from the year before. Mayor Lightfoot has called for using $25 million from those funds to help the city fill the budget shortfall. Normally, TIF dollars are used primarily to fund public works or development projects, and they've been a source of controversy among those that believe the money should just be part of normal property tax collection. Yarrow's office says the TIF values are rising because property values are rising.
the TIF is receiving more increment now, and typically increment does tend to increase as EAVs increase. So if EAVs continue to go up, then the TIF revenue will continue to go up. The White Sox Field of Dreams game was such a success that a White Sox Hall of Famer is buying the site where it happened. Former slugger Frank Thomas is reportedly heading a group that is buying a controlling stake in the company that owns a site in Dyersville, Iowa, where the classic movie Field of Dreams was filmed. Thomas will be named CEO of this new group. The game was one of Major League Baseball's highest rated non-playoff telecasts ever. Everyone remembers that thrilling finish there. And the site will host Cubs and Cincinnati Reds for a game next summer. And up next, a live report from what could become the new home of the Chicago Bears. So please stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols. The Jim and Kay Maybe family. The Polk Brothers Foundation. And the support of these donors. Suburban Arlington Heights is a close neighbor to O'Hare Airport and about a 40-minute drive from downtown Chicago. The village is one of the largest in the northwest suburbs and, of course, is home to what until last weekend was the world-renowned Arlington International Race Course. Chicago Tonight's Joanna Hernandez and producer Acacia Hernandez spent the day exploring Arlington Heights as part of our In Your Neighborhood series. Joanna joins us now to tell us a little bit more about the community. Joanna. Now that's right, I'm outside Arlington Park and the news about the Chicago Bears moving into the park has created tons of buzz, but Arlington Heights is more than the racetrack. Now today you'll hear how the suburb is navigating the pandemic and what this would mean economically if the Chicago Bears move into the neighborhood. It opens the, the doors for a lot of possibilities and I get the leadership in not only Arlington Heights but around the community coming together and being a part of that conversation is going to be exciting but also the businesses starting to kind of think how they can leverage this opportunity, a national opportunity to have that in our backyard. Man, how's it going? One of those businesses is the owner of Pacero, one of many restaurants located in the downtown area. I'm very excited for it and I think it'll just be another great step and a great addition to the village as well. And it's already a great place to you know, have a business and I think this will not only just help it. Matt Piotta moved to a bigger space just two months before the pandemic. He was forced to switch gears and find creative ways to stay afloat at a time when takeout was the only option. We opened up a farmer's market within inside the restaurant where people, you know, especially at the beginning when people were afraid to go out, we would offer normal grocery staples that people could take home and do it themselves. Piotta says he's grateful for the community and the Chamber of Commerce for coming together to support local businesses. The executive director at the Arlington Heights Chamber of Commerce says only a handful of restaurants permanently closed. Again, the credit goes out to the residents and the community in Arlington Heights. They rallied around our restaurants at the beginning to really do a lot of takeout and support them. The challenge now is like everybody else in business is looking for the staff. Arlington Heights is home to about 75,000 people. The majority of the population is white with the growing number of Asian Americans. We have a, a restaurant a place in a, a grocery store in the south end of town called Mitsua, one of the privately owned Japanese places in the area. And also, too, we work with the Shillin Association, which is a Chinese cultural center here in Arlington Heights that really services a lot of people in Arlington Heights. For longtime resident Cindy Brooks, the suburb is a safe place to raise a family. Schools are amazing, um, and I have a special needs daughter and her boyfriend, and um, they're accepted everywhere. We have a lot of great restaurants. We have a music venue here, um, Hey Nani. We have performing arts, um, Metropolis, and you know there's great boutiques to go shopping. I try to shop as much local as possible. Village officials say affordable housing has also been a priority. On the corner of Chestnut and Rand Road is the latest four-story affordable housing complex set to be built. We're standing on a 2.4-acre vacant piece of property. It's been vacant about 19 years. We used to have a restaurant on, on the site many years ago. Despite concerns from some neighbors about the proposed 40-unit affordable housing complex, Charles Perkins says it will offer an economical option for residents. We're a very job-rich area, and many of those jobs are service-related jobs, or they are 
um, you know, healthcare or teaching aids, things of that nature, that um, those are not the most high-end paid jobs and the rents and are uh, you know, fairly high in, in this particular area. So having affordable housing to allow people to live, work and play in the area. With about 70% of the population fully vaccinated, Riddler is optimistic about the changes set to come. It's that collaborative effort that people really respect one another. And we love to see that, continue to see that grow. And if you're looking for something to do this weekend, Arlington Heights is hosting Harmony Fest, an outdoor block party on Friday and Saturday. On Friday and Saturday, excuse me, there will be music and food from the area. And stay tuned. We are speaking with the mayor up next. But first, we toss it back to you in the studio. Thank you, Joanna. A lot to talk to that mayor about. We'll see you soon. With a new leader at the helm, Chicago Public Schools says it has strengthened its efforts to respond to the coronavirus. Amanda Venicky joins us now with a look at what changes are in store. Amanda. There we go. Sorry about that. Zoom issues. Think we'd all have it down by now. But <laughs> Brenda's um, and to that end, today marks one year or one month of school that is since CPS started. And unlike last year, when like me, all students were remote for most of that of the school year. It's reversed this time. Pretty much everybody in person, this despite a lack of agreement between CPS and the Chicago Teachers Union over COVID protocols. Now there's another change too. CPS has a new CEO. Pedro Martinez came from leading San Antonio, Texas schools. And today, his second day on the job, he made a promise. As father, as a CEO, I will not allow our children not to be in a safe space our staff not to be in a safe place. Martinez says that his seven and 11 year old will be going to CPS, he says, and they're going to be in school, in person every day. He says he understands the anxiety that parents are feeling as his family has challenges with asthma. Martinez says he knows also there have been concerns about how things have gone COVID wise so far this year, but he says that's in the past. He says from here on out, he owns what the district does. At the same time, he also asked for grace, saying that everyone is learning through the pandemic together. Now, among the changes that he is making, CPS's COVID dashboard will now be updated daily with the number of students in quarantine. <coughs> Pardon me there. CPS COVID cases also going to be updated daily. The website currently shows 1,100 cases among students so far, plus 343 cases among CPS staff. Chicago Public Health Commissioner Dr. Ellison already says while there have been clusters of cases, she says there have been no outbreaks, which she defines as five related cases. Now that is of little reassurance to CPS mother of three, Courtney Ritzema. I think as parents, we all know we send our kids to school and any other year, our kids come home sick with all kinds of illnesses. I don't, <laughs> there's never a season where I send my kids to school and they're not coming back with fevers and runny nose and coughs and kids pick up everything when they're in school and COVID is no exception. But Ritzema and other critics say there is little reason to believe CPS's numbers. Starting tomorrow, CPS does say that it will have COVID testing for students within every school. And Dr. Arwady says these screenings are for potential asymptomatic cases. If kids aren't feeling well, they should stay home. These are screenings, she says, meant to give officials security that there is no in-school spread. But according to the district of CPS's 361,000 students, only 13,000 have opted in. That is a rate of 3.6 percent. CPS requires families to proactively opt in to student testing. The enrollment process for opting into testing is not working. When only 3% of the school of the school population has signed up, that's that's not enough. That doesn't tell us anything. That that doesn't give us a sense of security.
Ritzema has not sent her children to school all year, and she doesn't plan on it for the foreseeable future. She's teaching them from home instead. A directive issued this summer by the Illinois State Board of Education Superintendent of Schools requires all Illinois districts return to in-person learning. The state also requires all teachers be vaccinated or they have to undergo weekly testing. And the state requires everyone in schools remain masked. Now, Arwady, Martinez, and other public health and education officials say it is better for children's emotional, social, and intellectual well-being that they attend class in person. I just don't understand how they can make huge statements like that. My kids don't go anywhere. I'm not taking them out in public. My kids are home. Ritzma tried to enroll her asthmatic daughter in CPS's virtual academy, but was denied it's for very limited cases. The district says now expanding online options is something that Martinez is considering. He was not definitive, but today says, I am going to be looking at what is our capacity to expand our remote options. If we can accommodate our families, I would like to do that. We're all hoping that uh, CEO Martinez follows through with this. We urge him to offer remote learning for all families who want that and who feel that that's best for their children right now because parents are the best people to make that decision for their, for their children. Now, as for other COVID protocols, the district and the teachers union held another bargaining session today, but no agreement was reached. We do expect to be hearing more from Martina soon. He says that he expects to do weekly updates. Brandis, back to you. Amanda, thank you. That's something we'll be watching, of course, as he does them. And now to Paris and a potential mega media merger. Paris. Brent is Chicago's public radio station and one of the city's most storied newspapers announced intentions to merge. The board of directors of Chicago Public Media, the parent of WBEZ, unanimously approved a non-binding letter of intent for the group and the Chicago Sun-Times to explore joining together as a local nonprofit news organization. So what does this mean for local journalism? Joining us is Matt Moog, the new CEO of Chicago Public Media, the parent company of WBEZ. We also reached out to Chicago Sun-Times CEO Nakia Wright, but she was unable to join us this evening. And Matt Moog, we're glad you're here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right, very simple question. Why merge these two companies into one? That's a great question. It's all about local journalism, uh, making sure that we have a sustainable model uh, to invest in more coverage, uh, more topics, uh, deeper journalism. By combining the two organizations, we double the size of our newsroom. We create the largest newsroom in the city of Chicago and what we think might be the largest nonprofit uh, local newsroom in the country. And does this mean that the Sun-Times continues on as a broadsheet with its own website? WBEZ continues on with its own newsroom, its own website, its own radio station? Or is it just one entity here? No, absolutely. These are, these are two brands that are storied brands in Chicago, have incredibly loyal readers and listeners. And we plan to continue to invest in them and grow them uh, and provide more journalism for people who listen to the radio, people who visit the website, who read the paper. Uh, it's just that the ultimate goal here is to build a, a larger audience. And as I understand, some philanthropic organizations like the MacArthur Center, uh, Michael Sachs, who was close to the former mayor, Rahm Emanuel, the Pritzker Traubert Foundation, they're instrumental in this deal. How did this deal come about? That's right. Yeah, well, one of the, the key things that's happening around the country, really, is that local journalism is being supported uh, by foundations and philanthropy uh, in order to make sure that the reporting for those uh, those cities remains uh, robust uh, and that we can have investigative journalism, uh, daily coverage, uh, and really great uh, storytelling. Uh, this came about by, uh, by Michael looking for a way to make sure that we can sustain uh, the level of investment uh, and growth, uh, really, that's what we're talking about here uh, for the Chicago Sun-Times. And since Chicago Public Media is both financially strong and has great relationships with the philanthropic uh, community 
uh, and a, a very strong base of, of members who support our work. And of course, hundreds of corporate sponsors. Uh, we were a great uh, uh, place to uh, make this combination. Is, is Chicago Public Media strong enough financially to be able to sustain running a newspaper? Because as we know, sometimes, as well as many newspapers, have struggled to be profitable for many, many years. Or will you need that kind of philanthropic support from MacArthur, Pritzker, Trobert every year to make the financials work? Sure. Uh, we, we have a plan that we've uh, vetted. Uh, that will make sure that we are sustainable based on the support of the of the readers, uh, digital subscribers uh, to the the online uh, website. Uh, but we we also have uh, been very fortunate to have support from some major foundations in Chicago and some individuals, and we hope to gain more of that support. And all of that support will go towards investing. Uh, in more journalism and better digital experiences uh, and making sure that we can continue to serve the entire community of Chicago. We're going to be able to reach more than 2 million people a week uh, across all of these platforms, print and broadcast and digital. Uh, and, we'll, and with the size newsroom that we'll have, we should be able to provide the kind of coverage that the Chicago area residents uh, deserve. So, so this is all going to be under the umbrella of Chicago public media. Public media traditionally is free, save for voluntary donations. So is it appropriate to have paid subscriptions and advertisements uh, in a public media company? Sure. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, and it's all about finding ways of supporting uh, the journalism. Uh, historically, we have made all of our content uh, available to uh, everybody who wants to uh, to take advantage of it. Uh, we hope to find ways to do the same here uh, for people that can't afford the content to provide ways for them to get it at no cost. Uh, typically for websites that do have a subscription option, more than 95% of the people visiting the website are able to consume that content for free. Uh, and we're gonna look for all kinds of different ways uh, to take advantage of a membership model or subscription or other things that will make it as accessible uh, as possible. And ultimately, uh, if we get the right kind of uh, support, uh, then we'll, we'll make it available uh, to as many people as possible. And as I understand, this deal could close by the end of the year. So practically, what does this mean for readers of the Sun-Times, listeners of WBEZ? Does anything change uh, in terms of their reading or listening experience? Sure, it's a good question. What we hope to be able to do is share content across the newspaper and the broadcast uh, and digitally uh, so that the different large audiences that are in different parts of the city uh, are able to take advantage of all of the, the content. Uh, of course, we'll have editors who understand uh, their audiences and what they're looking for and be able to uh, selectively curate the content for them and feature it in the right ways. Uh, but we do think there's an opportunity to amplify the stories that matter to Chicago uh, and to be able to cover different neighborhoods and communities uh, in ways that we're not able to uh, on our own. Uh, but together, we should be stronger for the benefit of all of Chicago. A few seconds left. I, I talked to a few folks over there that seemed confused by this deal, and they, they had no idea it was in the works. Uh, what, what's your message to, to your employees there that, that were kind of caught off guard? Yeah, no, it's a good question. We, we've been uh, discussing these things confidentially. Uh, so our, our employees just found out a couple of days ago. Now we of course have three months before uh, we ultimately close to get their, their input and ideas and, and questions, which we're really looking forward to. As you can imagine, uh, Paris, the journalists have lots of questions and we wanna be as transparent as possible with them and be able to answer all of those. But most importantly, we're aligned on uh, the goals and the vision for this to reach a large audience and, and help uh, inform them and educate them uh, and connect them in their communities. Uh, and that's what we think we're gonna be able to do here. As in terms of operationally, exactly how we put things together and what content we share, uh, those are the kinds of things that we'll be working with our own staff right. to determine. So those things still to be hashed out. All right, our thanks to yes. Matt Moog. Thanks so much for joining us. All right, thank you. And up next, the vision for redeveloping 12 acres of vacant prime real estate on the far south side. Spend Saturday evening with the Voices of Chicago. Latino Voices at 6 and Black Voices at 6.30. See you on Saturdays. 
12 acres of land on Chicago's far south side have gone unused for more than a decade. Now local leaders are working to redevelop the massive site into a mixed-use, community-driven project. As Chicago Tonight's Nick Blumberg reports, they've gotten millions in seed money from the state and are hoping for support from the city as well. The northwest corner of 115th Street and South Halstead sits at the intersection of West Pullman, East Morgan Park, and West Roseland. This prime real estate's been vacant for more than a decade since Jewel moved four blocks south and the Halstead Mall was torn down. This is almost like the downtown, and so this has become an eyesore for the community. So, Abraham Lacey of the Far South Community Development Corporation is working to turn that eyesore into an asset. 390 units of housing, 20,000 square feet of retail, a community center, and green space. It is going to bring life again to this very important and very crucial intersection. The new Morgan Park Commons would also connect to the Major Taylor biking and walking trail and a pace rapid transit route. The price tag is estimated at $117 million. Lacey and his partners got $15 million in seed money from the state of Illinois. It's really, really important that we begin to use a holistic, comprehensive approach that truly looks at community revitalization and the development of our neighborhoods. Lawmaker Justin Slaughter sees this project and others from the renovation of Jackie Robinson Park in Washington Heights to the CTA Red Line extension effort as a way to address long-standing needs. Not only do we expect a revival of sorts with the families and individuals that have always traditionally lived here on the far south side, but also kind of turning the corner from, from, from the pandemic and making the far south side of Chicago attractive again. The first phase of the project is 80 units of housing as well as commercial space along Halstead. If everything goes to plan, construction is set to start in spring of 2023. The housing will be a mix of rental units and single-family homes for sale, the majority of which Lacey says will be affordable. One of the project's partners is the nonprofit developer Preservation of Affordable Housing. This is pretty rare to have 12 acres, you know, adjacent to, you know, important commercial strips and adjacent to, you know, really nice, stable, single-family homes around it. You know, you're not building a building. You're trying to lay out a new part of the neighborhood. Bill Eager says developments bring both a renewed sense of community and more tangible results. It brings in the, the restaurants and the, the dry cleaners and the daycares and the, and the other types of services and jobs that people want. In addition to state money, Lacey says he's lined up private capital and equity partners. Right now, he's waiting to hear whether the city will approve a low-income housing tax credit, and he hopes to meet with the mayor's office and Department of Planning and Development to get on the same page. Some projects die because the, the red tape, the length of time it takes to get these things moving with our elected leaders as well as our community partners. There needs to be a little bit more tighter collaboration. The project's backers see this as the closest this site has gotten to a long-awaited redevelopment, and they don't want to lose any momentum. It feels good because this has been a long time coming, and the community has been patiently waiting for this to take place, and we are happy that we're at this point, that we can be able to deliver something to the community. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Nick Blumberg. And if construction gets underway as planned in spring 2023, the project's backers hope to cut the ribbon on the first phase in mid-2024. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, how local leaders are responding to the Chicago Bears signing a purchase agreement for Arlington Park. Plus, can the Bears bounce back against the Lions following last week's dismal performance? We have a game preview and prediction. A new MacArthur Genius Grant recipient joins us to talk about the past, present, and future of social movements for racial equality. And a bird who's on the brink of extinction might offer insights into climate change through its poop. We will explain. But first, some more of today's top stories. The Illinois State Police is more than doubling the amount of patrol units on expressways in and around the city. That's in response to the accelerated number of expressway shootings. ISP says as of today, the Chicago area has 185 reported expressway shootings this year, compared to 83 at this time last year, and a total of 128 in all of last year. State Director Brendan Kelly says the agency has never been confronted with the concentrated levels of gun violence it's seen last year and this year. 
In response, ISP is redeploying officers from around the state to the Chicago area and increasing patrol during peak criminal activity times. And this starts tomorrow evening and will continue during evening and overnight shifts. And 14 people have been indicted in federal court since the U.S. Justice Department launched a multi-region strike force to target illegal gun traffickers. The U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of Indiana says those 14 people are accused of unlicensed gun dealing and straw purchasing. That's when someone who is allowed to purchase a gun legally does so, but then turns around and sells that gun to someone who is not allowed to legally purchase it. The task force, which is made of federal law enforcement across Illinois and Indiana, say six of the people charged bought more than 90 firearms since November last year, 20 of which were recovered in Chicago during homicide and shooting investigations, as well as an incident where a Chicago police officer was shot. And Governor J.B. Pritzker is responding today to the possibility of the Chicago Bears leaving Soldier Field for Arlington Heights. I'm a Bears fan, and uh, and I know that it would be uh, a disappointing for me if Chicago Bears moved outside of the city of Chicago. I know I share that view with many other Chicago Bears fans, uh, but I think this is a you know a private business, the Chicago Bears, um, as I have said before, and I think that the Bears and the city of Chicago need to work out their differences in order for us to. You know, end up with the Bears uh, staying in the city. Pritzker says the state is not currently looking to intervene and is prioritizing the state's own fiscal situation. And of course, coming up in a bit, Paris has a preview of the Bears Lions game this weekend, as well as reaction from former Bear James Big Cat Williams. And now, Paris, back to you. All right, Brandis, thanks a lot. And now we go back to Joanna Hernandez on that topic of the Bears and their potential move. Joanna spent the entire day in northwest suburban Arlington Heights as part of our In Your Neighborhood series. Joanna, what do you got? Well, thanks, Paris. We're now here with the mayor of Arlington Heights, Tom Hayes. Thank you for joining us today. How are you doing today? Good, Joanna. Thank you for coming to Arlington Heights tonight. Of course. I'm happy to be here. Now, I have to start off with the biggest news of the week, the Bears signed a purchase and sell agreement with the race course. Where are we now? What can you tell us? Well, I can tell you that I'm personally very excited about this potential opportunity. Uh, you know, it's been talked about for months and months now, but we're very happy to hear the news that they've actually signed a purchase and sale agreement. And so there's still a lot of work to be done. But my goal was always to put this property, this very prime piece of real estate in our community to its highest and best use. And I really can't think of a higher and better use than putting the Chicago Bears here in Arlington Heights. And what would it mean for the community to have the Chicago Bears their home here. Well, it'd be very special, not just for our community, but for the whole Northwest suburban region. I think a lot of the Chicago Bear fandom is right here in the Northwest suburbs, and there's great access to this location from the north, south, east, and west. And so this property has a lot to offer for the Bears and the whole region. Now, we spoke to John from the Chambers of Commerce, and he was very optimistic about what the Bears would bring, not only locally, but internationally for the area. He said possibilities are endless. Do you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely, especially if you consider that the Bears could build a, a dome stadium here, which could be used on a year-round basis. So you're not just talking about during the football season, but we could attract other events, a Super Bowl, a Final Four, concerts during the winter time. So it's an exciting year-round opportunity for our community. Now, what kind of economic incentives would be on the table from Arlington Heights to lure the Bears here? Well, that's yet to be determined, Joanna. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it, but we understand that uh, there's a lot of hurdles that have to be overcome to get across the goal line to actually build a stadium here. And uh, the NFL gets involved. The state uh, has gotten involved in other communities when they're building professional sports stadiums. So we'll cross that bridge to uh, when we come to it. Would it be a possibility to, ta to use taxpayer dollars to help fund a stadium here? Well, they're a last resort, but we always consider tax incentives to attract or retain our businesses. So it's certainly a possibility. Okay, so backtracking a bit, in the midst of the pandemic, you had to make the decision of whether you would run a third term. What drew you? to continue this job? 
Well, I've been on the board for almost 30, uh, 31 years now. I've been mayor for eight and a half years. So I decided to run for a third term just because I didn't want to leave in the middle of the pandemic crisis. I had to make my decision last summer. We we're really right in the heart of the pandemic. I just wanted to make sure that I could help do whatever I could to help our residents and our businesses get through to the other side. And what is the difference between almost two years ago to what you see now? Well, I do see a lot of light at the end of the tunnel. Certainly our positivity rate is going down. Again, I'm very happy to see that. And so uh, we're very happy that uh, we're really looking at the other side of the pandemic curve and hopefully getting through to the other side in the next few weeks. And I want to quickly talk about your team hired a consultant to survey village employees and the community on diversity, equity and inclusion. What does that look like and why was that important for you? Well, we are a very diverse community. A lot of people don't think of Arlington Heights as a diverse community, but we really are for a number of different reasons. And so we've uh, included diversity, equity, and inclusion as one of our top strategic priorities for the next two years, and it has been for the last few years. And so we want to just have a welcoming community as much as possible where people can feel comfortable and welcome, whether they want to just visit here or whether they want to live here or start a business here. And so we want to do all we can to make people feel welcome in the village of Arlington Heights. And last question, are you a Chicago Bear fan? Absolutely. I went to my first Bears game back in the mid-1960s at Wrigley Field. So I know uh, they had 50 years at Wrigley Field, 50 years in Soldier Field. Hopefully they'll have 50 years or more here in Arlington Heights. Well, thank you so much for joining us here, Mayor Hayes. Thank you again for having me. Thank you. Now, Paris, will be back in a bit to talk to uh, let's talk about the loss of the Arlington Park race course after a nearly 100-year run. We toss it back to you now. Welcoming city, Joanna. I wonder if that includes welcoming the Bears uh, down the line. All right, Brandis, uh, we go back to you with a prestigious award. Paris, two women with ties to Chicago have been named geniuses by the MacArthur Foundation. The MacArthur Fellowship, better known as the Genius Grant, is awarded annually to individuals who've shown originality and dedication in their creative and or scholarly pursuits. One of this year's 25, announced just this week, lived in Chicago for 15 years, studying at Northeastern and Northwestern, as well as the University of Illinois. Kianga Yamada Taylor is currently a professor of African American Studies at Princeton University, and she joins us now. Kianga, welcome back and congratulations. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So first, tell us about that phone call you received when you uh, when you found out when the MacArthur Foundation called you. Uh, I was saying um, I, I was telling someone before that um, I have a my phone number still has a seven seven three. Uh, area code, and I think for the last few months, I have been getting uh, very aggressive spam um, from the 773 area code uh, about student loans, about extended car warranties, and you know various other things. Um, so when I got the call, uh, I had been answering these 773 calls over the summer uh, to demand to be taken off the call list, and so when I got the call. Um, I, the number is 773 because the foundation is located in Chicago. So um, I picked up the, the phone very tersely, um, ready to uh, engage in another you know, verbal confrontation to take me off the list. So uh, I was home and you know, I was with my five-year-old who was between in the space, between the end of daycare and the beginning of kindergarten. <laughs> I was about a week between the two. So um, I got the call around lunchtime and, you know, kind of and that five year old, out. Yeah, their yeah. face probably <laughs> went from, you know, like they were watching your face change from anger to, oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know he did. He did look concerned for uh, about a minute, um, you know, while I was on the call. So uh, I did go from um, anger to confusion to bewilderment and uh, the space of about 10 seconds. <laughs> so let's talk about what it is that got you noticed and the work that, you know, warranted this uh, award. You've lectured on historical problems that are very much still with us. Tell us a little bit about those. So my work uh, kind of is a combination of, uh, I look at uh, both historical issues that have to do with racism and discrimination in public policy and in private enterprise. So I'm trained as a historian. 
Um, but I also write about contemporary uh, race and politics and, and social movements. And I guess the kind of through line uh, between the two is uh, really trying to identify what is meant by systemic racism, um, again, in public policy and in the activities of the private sector uh, I look at them historically through the lens or window of housing and housing discrimination. Um, but I'm also interested in the ways that uh, black people, black communities uh, respond um, to these issues of discrimination and the way that uh, black people organize themselves, the way that they uh, understand uh, the nature of, of their uh, oppression and exploitation. Um, the, the reasons behind uh, uh, segregation that emerged out of black communities um, and the way that that becomes also a foundation for um, political opposition, resistance, rebellion, uh, and organizing as and, well. And you and I have talked about this a bit, uh, even you know before you left Chicago and headed to Princeton, yeah. um, particularly about like redlining in Chicago. Uh, and the city, yeah. of course, has a very rich history in many of the topics that you explore. Uh, how does how does your time in Chicago um, and the history of Chicago factor into and shape some of your work? I mean, my experiences in Chicago were a driving force behind me even making a, a decision. To, to go to graduate school. Um, I uh, lived in Chicago for long before I had decided to return to school. And one of the, the questions that um, eventually pushed me in that uh, direction um, really had to do with why is Chicago so segregated? Uh, when I moved to the city in 1998, uh, it was one of the, the first things that uh, struck me um, you know, I was moving from New York State where there are degrees of uh, racial segregation, residential segregation, but because of the compact nature of the city, um, it's really, you know, block to block can be radically different. And, you know, in Chicago, I mean, when I arrived in a city, I, you know, exited the highway at 75th and Stony Island, and you were literally driving for miles in an all-black enclave. Um, and I grew up in the South. I grew up in, in Dallas, Texas, and I had never uh, seen this level of racial separation um, in my life. And so I, you know, I lived in, in Hyde Park uh, for a while, uh, and I moved to Pilsen, and then I moved to uh, Logan Square, and you see this kind of racial enclosure um, uh, throughout the city. And so and that was really, yeah. Yeah, well, I was just going to say before we let you go, because we've got about 30, 45 seconds left, you know, sure. $625,000 over the course of yeah. five years comes with this award. Any plans forming uh, just yet on how you're going to put that to use? Sure. I mean, you know, I'm working on a, a couple of books. Uh, so this is kind of like a research money windfall. Um, and then uh, I'm also working on a kind of multimedia um uh, project with a former staff editor from the New York Times that uh, looks at race and politics and organizing from uh, a black left left wing uh, perspective. And so we're hoping to be able to launch that um, sometime in 2022. But okay. it's exciting. It's a you know, it's an exciting period to uh, kind of jump into these issues of uh, race, politics and organizing All right, to do so, the work that you do. Yeah, absolutely. Con congratulations again, Kianga Yamada Taylor. Thank you for joining us. We're looking forward to see what you do next. Thanks so much. And now, Paris, we toss it back to you. All right, thanks, Brandis. And now we check back in with Joanna Hernandez, who spent the day in Northwest Suburban Arlington Heights as part of our In Your Neighborhood series. Joanna. Yeah, Paris, well, we're now here with Tony Petrello, president of the Arlington International Race Course. Thank you for joining us today. I have to start by asking you, is it bittersweet to be standing outside the race course knowing that it has reached its final end? Well, yes, a little bit, but first, welcome to Arlington. That's something Thank we you. say to anybody that enters our facility because when people come here, uh, we treat them like they're guests in our home. So that's why it really makes this place so special and makes it a little bittersweet because each day here is a new day because there's always new faces and it's very exciting to see people come in and see this magnificent facility and their jaw drop and hit the <laughs> ground when they see its beauty. 
It did happen to me a little bit. So were you sad to say goodbye? Well, yes, but you know what? Uh, we, we had a motto around here the last month or so, don't be sad it's over, be glad it happened. And that really, you know, changed, uh, you know, everyone's attitude because we have a lot to be thankful for. We have a tendency to look at things in a more positive way and the relationships that we've built with our guests, with uh, the horsemen, and with each other as team members, it's just been really special for me over the last 27 years. And Tony, I know we can't talk much about the Bears deal to buy the race course, but as a longtime resident of Arlington Heights, what are your thoughts about the possibility of having the Bears here? Well, just at the onset of when the track was put up for sale, I think the mayor said it the best. They're looking for some other venue or something that's going to be able to maybe fill the shoes of the legacy of Arlington, and the Bears should be able to do that. It's going to be tough for them to fill it, but uh, I think they'll have a legacy of their own. Can you talk about what the race course has meant for the community? Uh, I think it's just they think of the race course as, as an extended family member. Most people you meet, they know someone who's worked here or they've been here, and it's really a multi generational type of experience where you've had grandfathers bring their sons, and their sons bring their, their sons and their daughters. And one thing about this facility, it was designed also to be very family oriented. So it was really one of the first venues in the United States that reached out to the female population. Wow. So it's, uh, you know, our demographics are half women and half men, which is unique for a lot of any sporting venue. And I do want to ask, would you be able to share one of your favorite memories here? You spent many yeah, years yeah. here. You just informed me that you had many jobs inside the racetrack. You know, what is one of your favorite memories that you could share with us? Well, one of my most favorite memories is when Mr. Duchessois' horse won the Beverly D, a race named after his wife. He was getting a standing ovation as his horse came into the winner's circle, and he was coming down the steps of the grandstand. Everybody was teary-eyed, and it was a grand applause for him, but no one got it on video. So it's something that has to be etched in your memory only because it's not available on video. So you have that in your memory, engraved in your memory. Yes. You have tons of memories. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, we'll have to pleasure. see what happens. Yes, come well, back thank, soon. Well, thank you so all right. much. All right, that is all that we have here from Arlington Heights. Thank you for joining us. We send it back to you. Mr. Duchessois, of course, a reference to the former owner of Arlington Park, Dick Duchessois. All right, Joanna, end of an era there. Up next, you've been waiting for it all night. We give you the poop on how bird droppings are helping scientists learn about climate change. But first, we take a look at the weather. Gonna say this bird poop we hate it on our cars avoid it on sidewalks and despise the occasional plop on our heads but it turns out some bird droppings could possibly unlock secrets of climate change wttw news reporter patty wetley has the scoop on poop so patty you caught up with a local doctoral student who studies bird waste who is she and why does she do this Yes, uh, Heather Skeen, she's associated with the Field Museum in the University of Chicago, and she actually studies pathogens that happen to exist in birds. Uh, so she wanted to study uh, the Kirtland's warbler, which is a migratory bird that um, it winters in the Bahamas. It has its breeding grounds in a very specific area in Michigan. And she was studying to see if its gut bacteria would be affected by that migration. So if you think about you and I, if we go from the Bahamas to Michigan, our gut bacteria stays the same. Most mammals, it stays the same wherever they are. This birds, it's actually, it changed from one location to the other based on its environment and its diet. And this can have implications for adaptability when it comes to climate change, um, which she will be studying going further. So um, yeah, she'll, she'll have more going on in the future. <laughs> more to investigate. So, uh, you yeah. know, w really quick, Patty, before we let you go, has the bird poop dropped any findings? <laughs> yeah, it was actually quite surprising that um, th it's called the microbiome is what the gut bacteria is kind of known as, that it's much different for birds than it is for mammals. And by studying this very specific species, 
that she was able to track the exact bird from one location of its migration to the next, she was able to determine um, how much difference there actually is. Okay, that's an interesting one. <laughs> Thank you so yeah. much, Patty Wetley. Anytime. <laughs> And you can read Patty's full story on our website. It's all at WTTW.com slash news. Up next, we preview the Bears matchup against the Lions. But first, a look at some events happening around town this weekend. Before the Bears changed the conversation this week with the big news of an agreement to purchase Arlington Park, there was a game, and it was bad. Rookie quarterback Justin Fields was sacked nine times by the Cleveland Browns, and head coach Matt Nagy was universally criticized for the perception that he called plays that didn't really cater to Fields' strength. Can the team remedy its offensive woes in time for the winless Detroit Lions who come to Soldier Field this Sunday? And joining us now is James Big Cat Williams, former offensive lineman for the Chicago Bears from 1991 to 2002. Big Cat, as always, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Bears. All right, let's start with that big news of the week. Uh, now that this deal is inked in Arlington Heights, do you think that the Bears are going to go through with it and move out of the lakefront? I, I can't see why they wouldn't. I mean, it's, it's a great opportunity for them to put, you know, a staple on a building that is theirs. Um, when you're talking about Soldier Field, you're talking about uh, limitations as far as seating and what they can accomplish as far as putting into the stadium. Whereas if they build a new one out in Arlington Heights, sky's the limit. I mean, you're talking about a new stadium with state-of-the-art technology, and I, I can't see how it's a bad thing. Yeah, it's such a hot topic uh, in Chicago this week. All right. The game was a hot topic before that uh, coach Matt Nagy got a lot of criticism for his play calling that led to nine sacks of Justin Fields. Do you agree that Nagy just didn't didn't call a game that played to field strength? Yeah, and, and, and look, you can't just blame the game on one person. You can't blame it all on Nagy, Coach Nagy. You can't blame it all on the offensive line. You can't blame it all on you can't blame it all on the receivers for not getting open. It was a group effort. I mean, you know, it doesn't stink that bad with just one one group messing up. So it was a it was a group effort, and everybody had a hand in it. And until you get these things straightened out, you just don't know how things are going to look. And Nagy's being really coy this week on who his starting quarterback is going to be. He said if Dalton is healthy, he is the starting quarterback. Who do you think it should be against Detroit this week? I, I, I'm torn on that because I think if Dalton is healthy, yes, you can put him back in there, but you don't want to mess with field psyche as far as, yeah, I went out here in my first game and, you know, the wheels fell off, and now I've got to wait six more weeks before I get another opportunity. You kind of want to get him back out there, get you know, get him back up on the horse, let him ride again, and see how it goes. But, you know, the game plan has to be different. You can't go into the Detroit game with the same game plan that you went in versus the Browns because you saw how bad that was. And are you saying maybe more protection for the quarterback, more people assisting the offensive line and blocking, more play action, rolling out the pocket? Well, it's got to be a little bit of everything. You know, we, we sat down and we had these conversations when Mitch was involved as far as, you know, he just didn't look good in the pocket and uh, he wasn't able to read defenses. Well, now you're dealing with another young guy that is going to have some of the same issues because he's young. So, you know, you look at the system that or the way that Laser called games towards the end of the season for Mitch, and, and that's what I want to see for Fields, the ability to run the stretch, uh, the outside zone and inside zone, to be able to run play action off of those plays, you know, plays that to the defense look like run and then all of a sudden turn into pass 
Now you have Fields on the total opposite side of the field. He's only reading two receivers. He has a high receiver. He has a low receiver. If one of those two guys isn't open, he takes off and runs. It, I mean, it, it, it doesn't seem that difficult, but in the course of a game, you have to, as a, as a coordinator, you have to set these things up. And I worry that sometimes Nagy doesn't worry about setting things up. He just wants to go out there and run his plays. Yeah, we'll see if he adjusts that. Uh, for Detroit, uh, is there a risk here with Fields, such a great talent, that um, a game like that, uh, more games like that, could mess with his psyche and could start to hamper his development? No, I think I think Fields is, and don't get me wrong, I don't know him personally, so I, I can't, you know, say... He is definitely this kind of guy, but he seems like a mentally strong guy. Uh, you know, coming from Ohio State, was at Georgia before that. He's been in big programs. He's had to deal with the pressure. I don't think the pressure is something that will build up and hurt him, but you don't want to take that chance. And, you know, if you're not going to put him in situations to win, then, yeah, why have him out there on the field? Speaking of situations to win, is this week a situation the Bears can win? The Lions are 0 3, but they might be hungry. Yeah, I'm, I'm really nervous about this game. Uh, Coach Nagy was very, uh, you know, off, off in a lot of different directions when he talked about play calling this week. If, if, if Laser is a play caller, I feel a little more confident in what they can pull off. I just haven't seen Coach Nagy with the young quarterbacks put them in situations to win, to build up an offense that can do the things they need to do as well as keep that defense off the field for a little while so they can get rest, pile up first downs, make third down conversions. You know, those third down conversions need to be easy. You want three, four, five yards for a third down conversion, and they just haven't been getting that. And when they have, they haven't been able to complete it. So this Detroit game makes me really nervous not knowing, um, you know, what their scheme is going to be like going into the game. All right, so you're saying you're nervous here. What's your bold prediction for Sunday? <sighs> not knowing who the O coordinator is going to be, who's going to be calling plays. I'm going 17-16 Detroit. I just think it's going to come down to the end, and I'm just not sure how, how, how they're going to pull it off. Oof, and if that happens, it's going to be a very interesting week uh, here in Chicago among fans and sports media. All right. James Big Cat Williams, thanks very much. Thanks, Paris. Have a good one. You too. And we're back to wrap things up right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols. The Jim and Kay Maybe family. The Polk Brothers Foundation. And the support of these donors. And that's our show for this Thursday night. Please join us tomorrow night at 7 for the Week in Review. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy and safe and have a great evening. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that's proud to serve its community through pro bono legal services.